Welcome back, America. David Bonson joins me, one of my great economic contributors. You often see David on Fox Business and on CNBC. Good morning, David. How are you? I'm doing great, Hugh. Good morning. Good morning to you. I want to begin. I told my friend Aaron Chadbourne, who Aaron is the weekend host on WGAN up in Portland. I went down and sat with him at uh, 98.5 News Talk and 5.60 a.m. In, in Maine on Saturday. I drove down to see him. I told him I never do the futures market because, you know, my show is sometimes listened to by people late in the day. But the futures market this morning is an exception because it's up even though Israel entered Lebanon and the war is expanding. Are you surprised by that, that the futures are sort of indifferent to, if not celebrating, Israel going over to the offensive? Well, uh, Hugh, the futures are down now a little bit, but they're not down a lot. And so you could argue, you know, the, it, right now the futures point to a Dow being down 140 points, um, which is nothing anymore. I mean, as a percentage, it would be like the old days, the Dow being down 20 or 30 points because the denominator is so large. Um, what's more, far more surprising and has been for some time is oil prices response, which is good to say almost none at all. Um, oil had averaged, let's call it, between $73 and $85 most of the year. And lately, as things have escalated with Israel and various activities with Lebanon, all the issues with Gaza, from Hamas all the way now to more recent with Hezbollah, it's averaged 68 to 73. Oil prices have been it's lower. It's at 67, it, 65. It, it's interesting. Mine show the futures up, David, on the CNN, but I trust your numbers better. Uh, West Texas is at 67.65, rent crude at 71.24. You're right, that's low. Yes, it is. And, and I promise, the future, I'm not sure you, there may be a delay in the feed or whatever. Futures, I've been up for an hour and a half and they've been down most of the morning, so there may be something wrong with CNN, which, you know, wouldn't be the first time CNN's been wouldn't wrong. Wouldn't be the first time, no. Um, so, David, the second the thing. Reason, Go ahead. I was just going to say, real quickly, real quickly on the oil markets. I think a lot of it is just that the markets have been fooled so many times that a geopolitical escalation was about to happen and cut off oil supply, and it hasn't happened. So traders are afraid to act on that. And then in the meantime, there has been a lot more supply that's come online. Well, the one thing that could get people jittery is if Iran hits Israel, this time I think Israel will blow up Karg Island. And that would have a real impact. I think they'll just smithereens wow. it. What kind of impact would that have on these oil prices? Well, I mean, to the extent that there's if that something like that were to happen and there was the supply shock that I believe there would be, it would push oil prices up substantially. But there's two levels to this. There's the immediate response, which is usually somewhat irrational and just everybody assuming something very badly. But then there's the more fundamental response, which could play out over a week or two. I think that would be quite detrimental as well. Okay, that, that's thing number one. I really wanted to talk to you about the International Longshoremen's Association strike. Now, their president made a statement yesterday. His name is Harold Daggett. It takes a minute 40, but I want our audience to hear it. I want your response at the other side. Here is Harold Daggett, president of the International Longshoremen Association, which have shut down the ports of the United States and the it's East Coast. Let me explain something to you. These people today don't know what a strike is. When my men hit the streets from Maine to Texas, every single port a lockdown. You know what's going to happen? I'll tell you. First week, be all over the news every night, boom, boom. Second week, guys who sell cars can't sell cars because the cars ain't coming in off the ships. They get laid off. Third week, malls start closing down. They can't get the goods from China. They can't sell clothes. They can't do this. Everything in the United States comes on a ship. They go out of business. Construction workers get laid off because the materials aren't coming in. The steel's not coming in. The lumber's not coming in. They lose their job. Everybody's hating the longshoremen now because now they realize how important our jobs are. Now I have the president screaming at me. I'm putting a Taff Hartley on you. Go ahead. Taff Hartley means I have to go back to work for 90 days. That's a cooling off period. Do you think when I go back for 90 days, those men are going to go to work on that pier? It's going to cost the money, the company's money to pay their salaries while they go, went from 30 moves an hour, maybe to eight. 
they're going to be like this. Who's going to win here in the long run? You're better off sitting down and let's get a contract and let's move on with this world. And in today's world, I'll cripple you. I will cripple you and you have no idea what that means. So David Bonson, I don't know if he's from New York or New Jersey or Boston. I can't quite figure out the accent, but what about Harold Daggett? Is he going to cripple us? No, but it is an incredibly transparent interview, isn't it? For him to yes. state to the American people that the leverage he has is he wants to try and cripple the American economy. It is a difficult way to negotiate. Um, again, I recognize the difference when violence is not involved, but it rhetorically is a terrorist talk that, that you're going to do such great damage that someone's going to have to give you what you want. That is um, not a way to win friends and influence people. And he's wrong that that tactic is what is going to be effective because ultimately the public sentiment will turn fast with more people like you playing that clip. Well, that, that clip's going to go viral because it is a throwback to 30 style union rhetoric. And it's got, right. it, it, he's, been a, he's been running the ILA for 15 or 20 years. Harold Daggett's been around forever. And the longshoremen, ever since Eric Hoffer entered my world, matter a lot to me. They work hard, uh, but they also, I don't think they can shut down the economy. I don't think malls are going to close. I don't, think, I don't think there's any shortage of cars for like three months. Am I right? You are absolutely right. There is always marginal uh, uh, challenges that can happen, but a shutdown, the idea, no cars, no lumber, no steel, it reflects an incredibly ignorant understanding of the complexity of supply chains and the contingencies that are already in place. I mean, before, Longshoremen didn't go on strike. COVID, they shut down the whole world and supply chains were dramatically impacted over a period of time. But we're talking, but they didn't shut everything down. 78% of cargo still got through and so forth. This is not good. And there are delays and marginal impact, but that kind of rhetoric is so over the top, it's really creepy to hear. Now, I want to close by asking you about energy. I think energy is freedom. I've talked with Doug Burgum about this. I own some Microsoft, so I always declare that. I was very happy when Microsoft bought Three Mile Island. David, what are you telling the investors that you advise at the Bonson Group about energy stocks, energy production, and the firms like Microsoft that are moving to secure available base loads? Well, there's a number of different elements. I mean, at a high level, just philosophically, energy independence is deeply connected to the supply side economic ideology. Those who favor lower taxes and favor uh, deregulation have to be supportive of energy independence. But it also is one of the elements in American policy that has a strong geopolitical ramification. So there's a whole lot of reasons why I support a robust energy portfolio for policymakers. And to me, the electricity production needs we have have no chance of ever being met apart from natural gas. So if somebody tells you we need more power, we're big AI guys, we're big tech guys, but no, we don't want natural gas. And, and that includes exporting LNG to the rest of the world, but it's particularly just within our domestic needs. Um, an energy portfolio from an investor standpoint needs to be centered around the ability to produce natural gas, which we have that in spades, but to ship and move and store natural gas, which policymakers seem hell bent on trying to impede. Last question, David Bonson. You talk to very smart people every day, some of the world's wealthiest people invest with the Bonson Group because they don't, they're like me. They, they follow it, but they don't want to make decisions. What do you tell them about the election? What does your spidey sense tell you about the election? Well, uh, you're accidentally giving me a chance to tout uh, DividendCafe.com, which is my weekly investment writing. I just posted on Friday, I do it every four years, a pretty extensive white paper on the ramifications of the election. So it's posted right now at DividendCafe.com for free. But the, the Reader's Digest queue is that there are different elements, pros and cons, that can come out of different results. And historically, the biggest mistake people make is believing that the number one driver of their portfolio is who's president. The uh, returns over four-year periods, Republican or Democrat, since the beginning of the 20th century are almost identical. However, 
there are on the margin different sectors that are going to be impacted differently. You know, the energy sector has done very well under uh, Biden Harris because they have helped boost prices up, eliminate competition for producers, which has helped incumbent names like Exxon and Chevron. I think in a Trump administration, you're going to get more support for export LNG pipelines, new permit approvals, and hopefully new E&P, smaller cap names. So in both cases, it helps the energy sector, but it helps it differently. But the main thing, Hugh, I'm sorry for going on so long, her crazy tax policies are never going to become law. And so we should speak out against it. We should talk about the dangers of a wealth tax, of taxing unrealized capital gains. It's never going to happen. Not only because the Republicans hey, are going to win that. State take a minute, Canada, David. You, you take one minute to explain to people. It is the nuttiest, craziest. It's also unconstitutional. But tell people what happened yeah. with an unrealized capital gains tax. It, it is unconstitutional. It would never see light of day. And people say, well, what if the Republicans do lose the Senate? There aren't 50 Democrats that will vote for it either, just so we're clear. At least not at this point in the Democrat Party. They don't even have 50 Democrats. Even without Manchin and Cinema, they don't have 50 Democrats. But taxing unrealized capital gains is philosophically insane. And, and it would create a level of complexity and misallocation of resources and other just uh, adjustment around it that it would be highly uh, destructive to the economy. But it will not happen. Capital flight and, occur? Of course. But even, not even just capital flight out of our borders. Even within our country, the way in which people would reallocate resources, um, this is one of the points that the art laughers of the world have been making forever, is you underestimate the ability of people to act in their own self-interest to avoid irrational Amen. tax burden. Yeah. And that would be in spades if Kamala Harris's yeah. tax plan is adopted. David Bonson from the Bonson Group, thank you. DividendCafe.com. I'm going to go over and read that during the break.